every relationship, because we're different people, they all have a little bit of conflict. There's always conflict at some point along the way in some form or fashion in every kind of relationship that there is. It's just inevitable. And so it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And so we've been talking about in this series how to deal with that. So the, and, and this isn't just kind of like psychobabble, okay? This, this really is scriptural. This is what Jesus and those who came after him who would write some things down, this is what they began to teach. And this is so important for us to, to grasp. And that really the bottom line here is when it comes to handling conflict, like if you had to really take something away from this whole series, the goal is, the idea is, is that we would all be willing to become a peacemaker. A peacemaker, not, not somebody who just kind of fakes it and acts like things are good, but also not somebody who's constantly, you know, going at it and taking peace, but somebody that's, that's willing to make peace. And that requires a fight. And this is what we said, a peacemaker is willing to say things like this. I don't want the fight to be right. That's not my goal. A peacemaker says, I'm willing to fight to make things right. In other words, I'm going to prioritize you, what benefits you, what benefits our relationship over what I want, over what I think is right. Yes, that's kind of what comes natural, but I'm choosing to set my right to be right aside for the sake of our relationship because I want to make things right. I want to pursue peace. I want to make things right between us. So that's where we've been. Well, this week, um, you'll have to go and you know, catch up on what all that really looks like over the last few weeks. But, but this week, um, I want to present something that, uh, that I actually learned a, a whole bunch of years ago. It wasn't, I, I was, you know, I didn't come up with this. Um, it was a lesson that really I needed to learn years ago. This is probably 10, 10 or 12 years ago. I was at a leadership conference um, and, and of course, what they were talking, talking about was within the context of, you know, leading teams and organizations and that sort of thing. Um, but, but it impacted me so much. Like, it just stuck with me so much. I was like, oh my goodness, that's so simple and yet incredibly profound, usually the way things go. It was so impactful that, that it became like the first thing that I wanted to share with our teams when we launched this church five years ago. And I'm not, and I'm not kidding. Over and over and over again, we have had numerous conversations where this has been the center of our attention. This has always come right at the forefront. And not just as it relates to our staff, but to all of our teams, our volunteers, just people in the church in general. Because here's the thing. This isn't just a leadership principle. This isn't just for, you know, staffs and teams and leadership and all that. This really is a relationship principle. If we could get this today, it would be a game changer for our relationships. So let me, let me start it this way, just kind of paint you a picture. In every conflict, okay, so if you can kind of get this picture, in every conflict, when there's a conflict in a relationship, there is a gap that's created between what you expect and what you actually experience. Think about that. You have expectations of what you want to see happen, but then you've also now experienced what has actually happened. And it wasn't exactly what you wanted to see happen. And in the middle is where conflict resides. Conflict happens. In other words, it's, well, you know, you promised that you would be home in time for dinner, and yet, you know, you're late again. You know, you promised that you would do this, but, you know, this is what happened. You, you said that you were going to get that report to me on time, but, but of course, I, I haven't seen it yet. <clears throat> there's, a, there's a tension there. There's a conflict. You had an expectation it didn't get met, it didn't get fulfilled, and so there's a gap, okay? So we all get that. We've seen this. You probably are all in here today with some gaps. Some caused by others, some created by you, but we understand this. <clears throat> but what we need to understand, and this is, where, this is where we mess up, is that we have a choice as to what goes here. We have a decision that we can make as to what we place in the gap. Between, well, these were my expectations, but this is what actually happened. And see, we don't really think that way because we think, no, 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 no. You don't understand. I had expectations. They didn't follow through. They did it. I don't have a choice. Isn't that the way you feel? So, no, no, no. This is what they did. I don't have a choice in the matter. I, I'm just doing, I, I'm just responding based on what I've seen. And I mean, this has just been my experience over and over again. They just keep not following through. They keep not doing what they say they're going to do. I didn't do that. 
I don't have a choice, in the, or it's just my personality. That's just kind of who I am. But here's what we need to get on the front end of this. We need to, to start, uh, just put aside your presuppositions and just imagine with me for a second that there really is a choice. That we make the decision. We don't create the gap in this instance. You know, if you're on this side of things, you haven't created the gap, but you have a choice what you're going to put in it. And you have two options. Trust or suspicion. You either choose to trust in spite of everything else, or you're a little suspicious. Mm, yeah, mm. So, so you either, on the one hand, it's, well, you know, you're late again, but, you know, I, you know, maybe there was some, you know, traffic, you had trouble getting out of the office on time, maybe, or, or, you know, you're late, and guess what? You're always late. That's just kind of what I've come to expect with you. That's suspicion. You've chosen what you want. You, you said you were going to do this, but you didn't. And so trust says, but, but I'm going to choose to assume that everything's okay. I'm going to believe the best about this situation. In spite of what you've done before, in spite of my experience, I'm going to just believe the best. Or you can be suspicious and just say, well, you know, that, that's what happened, but, um, you know, you've done this before. And so, I, you know, you just assume the worst. You go there because this isn't the first time, this is the 10th time. And so, of course... I know what goes there. That's not my fault, that's yours. But what we need to understand is that this is the decision that we make. We have a decision. No, you didn't decide to create the gap. But yes, in spite of what they've always done or who you always are, the type of person you are, you still get to choose what you put in there in spite of their continued and repeat offenses and failures. In spite of. And there's a couple of things that lead us to this. And so we just, that, that, that make us a little uh, suspicious, that cause us to not be trusting of somebody. First of all, yeah, it's who you are. Who you are plays into this. Just kind of your background, your personality, whatever you want to call it, <clears throat> the way that you were raised, or some of us just have a bent towards suspicion. You're just a little <clears throat> suspicious by nature. It's just kind of who you are. I mean, probably you wouldn't care raising your hand. It's like, yeah, absolutely, yeah, I'm, I'm just that way. You know, maybe it was, you just got burned by somebody, you know, one too many times in the past, or maybe you went to that church and something happened, and now you're trying out some new places, and immediately something begins to look a little familiar, <clears throat> and so your, <clears throat> excuse me, your antenna go up, and all of a sudden you're thinking, uh-oh, here it goes again. And you get a little suspicious, it's like, I wonder. And so you kind of take all of those feelings and that baggage and you kind of dump it into this situation and it doesn't feel good. You know, well, this is what they've always done. And so that's just my experience or I've been hurt in the past or I've been betrayed by people I love or that say they love me. And so I don't have anything to give now. <clears throat> I'm just not buying it. And you're just a little suspicious. So sometimes that that's just kind of becomes our nature. It's what we kind of lean toward. But then, of course, it also is just what you've experienced. Even in that situation, it's like, you know, you, they, they said they were going to do one thing. They didn't follow through. As a matter of fact, that's been numerous occasions. And so now you're having a little, you know, a little issue trusting them. Go figure, right? Some of you are thinking, yeah, I mean, like, so I mean, why are we even talking about this? This isn't my problem. I've got nothing to work on here. That's their problem. They created a gap. But did you know that, that even though these are the things that actually lead us toward not trusting people, they tend to cause us to be that way. This is a problem because trust is the thing that we need the most. You see, here's what's interesting. We act like we don't have a choice. And yet when some of you have decided to put trust into a situation that seems like you shouldn't, you've seen things begin to benefit within the relationship. Why? Because there's never enough trust in a relationship. The more trust you have, the better things are. The less trust there is, the worse things are. Why? Well, because trust is the centerpiece. I said this a couple of weeks ago. It's the centerpiece of a healthy relationship. Trust. 
not suspicion, not, well, there you go again. Oh, well, you did it again. Or, oh, I, you know, this is just kind of par for you. This is par for the course. This is just what I expect of you. Of course you did that. Of course you're thinking that. Of course you treated me, treated me this way. Of course you didn't follow through. When we talk that way, that just continues to push the gap farther apart and the relationship eventually will crumble. Why? Because trust is required for a healthy relationship. It's like, well, that's just not fair. That's not about fair. It's about the decision to say, I care about the relationship and I care about the person enough to continue to put trust in the gap, even when it seems like there's no reason to. I'm gonna put trust there anyway. Because you see, trust, trust is chosen and it should be our first response. Trust it. Let me just say that, and, and even, even the scenario that you're thinking of, because, because we all you know, think, no, 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 there's some pushback here. Trust is chosen, and I'll show you that in just a second, and it should be our first response. Yuck. Even, yes, even in the worst of situations, in the worst of, it doesn't mean that they have any reason to be trusted. It doesn't mean that, that what it looks like isn't actually true. It just means first response, always trust. Well, that just, uh, you just don't know my situation. You don't know what things look like. If you knew my story, if you knew my story, and I know some stories, you wouldn't feel that way. You would understand. You would understand why I am justified to act just like I want to act. And essentially, that's what we do, right? We just want to kind of, do what we want to do. We, we want the right to be able to treat somebody a certain way because they have continued to create this gap. It's not my problem, but ch trust is a choice and it should be our first response. And here's the thing, I'm not making this up. I'm really not. This isn't just like a really good idea of how to keep peace in the home or how to make that. This is not my idea. Jesus talked about our relationships all the time, but you know what? He didn't just talk about good relationships. He talked about the ones that are difficult, the ones that are hard. Jesus even referred, he, he took it a step farther because sometimes the conflict that we're all thinking of, you know, are usually with people that we actually care for. Am I right? I mean, it's usually people who we actually have a good relationship with or we wanted to have a good relationship with. And they continue to create a gap. And so we're just trying to imagine the scenario. Yeah, I would love to be able to trust him. Jesus said, no, 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 no. It's so much a choice that you can make that it's not even just the people that you already are in relationship with or that you actually care for. It's even the worst of the worst. Somebody you might even call an enemy. That's the way Jesus put it. But to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. That can be translated, those who are hostile towards you. Those who have hurt you those who have caused you pain, those who have not followed through, who have not done what they said, who lack consistency, who don't seem trustworthy, anybody can fall into that category because he took it all the way to the top. Like that's the worst of the worst. And he's saying, yeah, you can even love your enemies. Why can we love our enemies? Because it's a choice. I want you to love even them. And to love is to, to be willing to trust, no matter what. Love your enemies. Well, I mean, what does that look at? Yeah, do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. You ever tried that? That's a tough one. Pray for those who mistreat you. I don't want you to... We, we have a tendency to think, no, 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 it's just, you know, reciprocation. It's like eye for an eye. Tooth for a tooth. That's the way we operate. Well, you know, you scratch my back. I'll scratch yours. You do for me, then I'll do for you. Or I'll think about it anyway, you know? Like, if it's enough. If I like it enough, like, I'm not doing that. You know, you haven't done that for me. It's like, you don't deserve that, you know? And we, we, but Jesus said, that's not how you're to act. That's not who you are. Those who want to follow me, those who want to be my disciples, you will be willing to choose to love even your enemies. Place anybody else in that category. And they're a step above enemy, right? Your spouse, your kids, your best friends, your co-workers, your colleagues. 
I mean, anybody is better than just an absolute hostile enemy. And so even them, we can choose to love. Well, why is that? Well, because I want you to do to others as you would have them do to you. It's like, well, I've heard that before. So that's, that's, not, that, that's actually like a Bible thing. That's not just a cute, like, cultural thing. Do to others what you wish they would do for you. We don't like to operate that way. We live in a world where it is reciprocation. It's like, do for others what they've done for you. Treat others the way that they treat you. But Jesus said, no, 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 I want you to turn that upside down, and I want you to treat others the way that you want to be treated. That's the way you should consider this. Love others the way you want to be loved. Trust others the way you want to be trusted he turns it upside down because isn't that really the deal i mean isn't that the kind of relationship that we want isn't that the kind of love and the kind of decision that we want other people to choose for us when we because we all create gaps did you know that like everybody does nobody meets everybody's expectations all the time everybody creates gaps and so isn't that the way that we want other people to handle us isn't that the way that we want people to love us? It's like, well, I mean, even in my, on my worst days, I'm hoping that they'll, that they'll just kind of give me the benefit of the doubt. I know it looks bad, but could you just trust me? I know I've done this 50 times, but, but this time I promise it's different. It's like, you want them to trust you, don't you? Okay. Then that's what you should be willing to offer. You see, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. It's like Jesus saying, that's like easy love. That's, that's hopefully the honeymoon period in a, in a, a marriage. You know, it's that, that honeymoon phase of like, like, it's easy. At least for a few minutes. You know, like it's, it's easy for a little while. You want the decision to be an easy decision. But Jesus is saying, it's an easy decision when somebody loves you already. And it's like, well, I love them too. That's easy. They treat you good. Well, so I treat them good. They do good things for me. They're consistent. They follow through. They do what they say they're going to do. Oh, I just love them, man. They are. But that's Jesus is saying, what? That's easy. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? It's like, I'll give you some, but I'm expecting pay. Like, yeah, I'll be glad to offer that to you, but you better pay it back. And that's the only way that I'm going to give it to you is if you give it back. It's like, well, yeah, that's just smart, okay? But even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full. He's just making the point, like, that's easy. There's nothing, there's nothing amazing about that. That's an easy kind of love. But Jesus is saying, what I'm suggesting to you, yeah, is way more difficult. It will require a decision, a really difficult decision. I'm telling you, love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them without expecting to get anything back. That's the kind of love I want you to have. And isn't that the kind of love that you want? And when you're willing to love that way, when you're willing to prioritize the other person in the relationship in that way, you're willing to put trust in the gap. When there's a discrepancy between what you expected and what you actually experienced and what they actually did, what you saw actually happen, Choosing first to put trust in that gap should be our go-to. Well, then the Apostle Paul, several years later, picked up on this line of teaching. He took what Jesus was saying. He even fleshed it out a little bit more, gave us what I feel like is a, is a really great description of what this kind of love really looks like. If you've ever been to a wedding before, you've probably heard this little passage of Scripture read because it, it just... It always feels so fitting, but it, hasn't, it really isn't just a marriage thing. Like, we've kind of categorized it like, okay, that's the marriage chapter, you know, or that's all about, you know, that kind of love. But no, no, no. This is all relationships. This is just what it means to love like Jesus loved. This is the kind of love that, that Jesus was talking about here. And I love the way he describes it. He gives, this to, gives it to us in a way where there's, there's really no way to interpret it any differently. There's really no way around this. It's either just totally ignore this passage or there's something we've got to do with this. And this is the way Paul describes it. He's writing to a church in Corinth. These are a group of Christians and he's reminding them of the way that they're supposed to interact with one another but also with people 
in the world around them. He says, love, let me tell you what love is. It's patient. It's kind. Love is patient. Well, how patient? When they don't do what they said they were going to do that once? Yeah. Then, and then the 51st time as well. Love is patient even then. And kind. There's a, there's a willingness to place something else in the gap other than well there they go again well that's just what i expected well of course that's just par for the course for you it's just a, a, this this extreme patience it's not he doesn't even qualify it love is patient you know like almost all the time or like it's just patient that's what love is and get this it does not envy it does not boast it is not proud but look at this it does not dishonor others it doesn't embarrass people in front of others. Even those who don't follow through. And I think we, we have a, there's just something in us that wants everybody to know how somebody else messed up or how they keep messing up. Why? I think because it justifies how we're about to treat them. It's like we're just going, we're going to make sure everybody knows just how they are and how they act and what they're like and how they continue to do it, so that everybody, we don't want anybody, you know, being deceived. That's really what, that's what we say. Well, I just don't want them, you know, you know to, to, to begin to trust them with something they shouldn't trust. It's like, that's, we, we dishonor them in front of other people, and it justifies the way that we feel about them, and the way that we want to treat them, and what we want to put in the gap. Isn't that true? We, we dishonor them. It's not self-seeking, though. It's not easily angered. Why is it not easily angered? Well, because after a couple of weeks ago, we know now that we're being slow to speak and quick to listen. And so we're going to be slow to anger, right? We're not talking quite as much, and we're listening a whole lot more until the point that we really do understand somebody. And so we're just not going to get as angry quite as quickly. We're not just going to kind of spout off in the moment keeps no record of wrongs. There's not like this little, you know, hidden memo book with tally marks. It's like, there he goes again, check. Late again, oh, check. Didn't do it again, check. Didn't say that again. Said they were going to do this. Promised we were going to go on a date this week. Now, I didn't remind them, but check, they didn't, they didn't remember. And, and, and we keep this little record. But here's the thing. That's poison to a relationship. With love, there is no place for bitterness or grudge holding. That kind of love. Well, you just don't know. It's like, well, yeah. Jesus knows. He understands what that felt like. He knows what betrayal looks like. What did he put in the gap? Himself. Love always, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. In other words, it doesn't go, <laughs> I knew it. There you go again. Just what I expected. Said you were going to do this. You didn't do it. I knew it. You're just said, like, this is who you are. You don't respect me. You don't love me. You don't really care for me because you just continue to do this. Like, th this is just who you are. It just drives me crazy. Could you not, you ever, anybody guilty of that? It's almost like we, we're like waiting on it. It's like, I want a reason to be mad at you. Don't show up on time because like I've got a good one-liner. I've got a zinger. I don't, don't, don't actually follow through on something five days in a row this time because on the sixth, when you mess up, I've got one in I mean, I've, it's, I'm, I'm holding it. It's coming. Don't delight in evil. It rejoices with the truth. You long, love really longs for people to succeed where they've always failed. Always longs for that. It doesn't just end at some point. It always protects. I'm willing to, to, to come to your defense when others are questioning you. When others place suspicion in the gap. I'm going to come to your defense. And then I'm going to always trust, at least first. I'm going to put trust in that gap. I'm willing to do that always. I'm just going to believe the best. I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it. Instead of assuming the worst. Always hopes, always perseveres. And when you love that way, love can't fail. 
There's no... If you imagine you t- if you were to love somebody that way, like honestly, you really all of that stuff. It's like that is I have loved this person that way. There's no failure. It is all in their court. It's on them. It's it's <laughs> because you haven't failed them. Love can't fail. You can't push back against that kind of love. And that kind of willingness to trust. You see, I think we all want the same thing. I don't think anybody really wants divisive, yucky, tense relationships with anybody. And I'm not just talking about marriages. I'm not, parents and kids, you know, with, with your friends, your group, your, your posse. You know, the people you hang out with, the people that you do life with, your small group, the people you work with, your colleagues, your, you know, boss, employee type relationships. Nobody wants conflict in those relationships. We want peace. But I think what we often forget is what is what that really looks like. What does a healthy relationship really look like? Well, we said at the beginning that trust is the centerpiece of every relationship, but it's also the currency of a healthy relationship. It's what you bank up in order to spend, so to speak. It's the currency of a really good, healthy relationship. In other words, the more that you are willing to put trust into the relationship, the more leverage you have to be able to speak into somebody's life. When you put suspicion in the gap, what does that do? It just does nothing to close the gap. Matter of fact, it becomes more like poison in in the relationship. It's easy to do. It's it's natural because of who we are, because of what we've experienced. We understand that. That's why this is a decision. It's choosing. It's saying, this relationship needs more trust, not more suspicion. And I need to, to put that into this. I'm willing to do that. And man, when you begin to do that, it gives you leverage. Did you know that that your willingness to trust, even in difficult situations, even when they don't seem trustworthy, your willingness to trust actually produces and, excuse me, fuels their productivity and their willingness to actually work on the things they need to work on. It's inspiring. It's like, wow, really? Like, you believed me? Like, I I shouldn't have lied the first time, you know? Like, I should have just told you. Instead of, well, you're, you're late again. You stopped by the bar again, didn't you, on your way home? That's why you're late. You just, that's what you did again. Well, no, actually, I stopped to get you flowers, but you believe what you want. It's like, well, that's, that's no fun. What if we just chose in that moment to, to just place trust there? All of a sudden, there's this willingness to want to be trustworthy. Nobody wants to not be trusted. That's not fun. Matter of fact, my wife, Rebecca, who's sitting up here on the front row, like, I wonder what he's about to say. Um, But I've talked about us each week, and so I I didn't want to miss today. This this is actually how she she handles me the large majority of the time. And I think, you you ready for this? And and I think in any healthy relationship, that that is valuable. That's gold. There, there's, she, has such, she has such an inflated sense of my value and my worth that she's willing to always believe the best even when I continue to do something stupid. Even when it's like, well, this is just kind of who he is. This is how he does. She always, you know, it's, well, he did it again, you know, but I bet there's a good reason. That's typically the response. That's typically what her mind is willing to think. And she has to choose to do that. But she so values me and my trustworthiness that she's willing to do it. Even when I have forgotten again or I didn't show up on time or I didn't want to, you know, I, you said you were going to call so-and-so. And you did, you know, did you call? Well, you probably had a good reason. I'm willing to do that. Well, actually, I didn't. I have a really good reason. Like, I just forgot. It's like, okay, well, that's fine. That's her posture the majority of the time. And, and, I, and I bet there's some of you in here who would think, well, that's just silly. That's just living in denial. That's just like being ignorant. 
But let, me, let me ask you something. Well, let me just say this first. You're right. It is a little bit. And I think it's kind of like that's what love is when it's blind. There's just such a willingness to believe the best about somebody because of your love for them, because of your love for the relationship, that you're willing to be a little blind sometimes and to live in that kind of denial. But honestly, let's think about that. What kind of relationship would you rather be in? Nobody wants to be in a relationship where there's always constant suspicion to live with somebody or to be in a relationship with somebody who's always pointing out your faults and your failures and where you keep messing up. Well, I mean, you just, you're just never on time. Like, that's just, you never turn stuff in. That's good. Your work is really poor. Your performance, no good. You just continue to eat too much. Like, that's just not good. You're putting on too much weight. Like, you just really need to pay attention. Like, who wants to live in that environment? I would rather live with somebody that's blind to all of those things. That's willing to trust first, regardless, because they so... They have such an inflated view of my value and my worth. That's what people long for. And that's what love is willing to get. And I get it. Trust is risky. Trusting is risky. I mean, good grief. Giving the car keys to a 16-year-old is risky. And here, I trust you to go to the grocery store. Call me when you get there. Call me when you're leaving. Call me when you get in the driveway. I'll help you, I'll help you park, you know, it's, it's risky, but you do it, you put trust there, my son just a few weeks ago, he wrecked his car, guess what, he's driving another vehicle, like, it's okay, I mean, I want to trust him, I want him to know that I'm willing to put, I'm a little nervous, but I'm willing to put trust there because of the relationship. I'm willing to try that. I mean, it, just getting married, saying I do, and, and trusting that, that the other person on the other side is, is saying I do as well, and that they're going to commit to that for the rest of their life. That's risky, but we're willing to do it. And relationships are better for it. Our relationships are better because of it. It doesn't devalue. It's not living in denial. It just helps build trust into the relationship, which is what we all need in those relationships. So let me ask you a couple of questions. We've done this each week. Are there people in your life you have a hard time trusting? I bet we don't even have to like take a, you know, a vote here. Imagine we all do. But the question is, would your relationship improve if you chose to trust in spite of the gaps? I imagine there are some gaps created by people in your life and there's some conflict, there's some tension. You have a hard time trusting them. But do you think, can you imagine the scenario where if you were to begin to choose trust and to put trust in those gaps, do you think the relationship would improve? Now imagine you'd be hard pressed to say, well, no, it wouldn't get any better. But what if you, what if you began to do that? That would be hard. But maybe, maybe you are. Maybe you're willing to. You think, I, I think that, that sounds like that would be the better option. What do I do? So I've got three, three things I want to I highlight. And, and these, we'll, we'll just call them the gap commitment, okay? So we're going to make a commitment to filling the gap with trust. And here's, here's the way that begins to pan out. And this is practicing making trust your first response, okay? So this is kind of what you'll need to do. And you may have to like, start saying this like a mantra, but if you want to write something down, this will, be, this will be one of those things. First, when there's a gap, I will fill it with trust first. Just being willing to commit to that. That's, that's number one. When there's a gap between what I expected of you, what you said you were going to do, and what actually happened and what you actually did, when there's a gap, I'm choosing regardless of, whether it's the first time or the 101st time, I'm going to choose, I'm going to choose to trust first. Number two, when others fill the gap with suspicion, I will come to your defense. I'm saying I'm going to choose to trust, but others might not, you know, like that one too much. 
And so they're getting suspicious and they're talking about it. And I mean, we've struggled with this as a staff. Like these are things we talk about all the time. It's like, it's so easy to kind of all get on each other's page because, you know, we like to talk about the, the things that, that we're dealing with, with somebody. And so we kind of get everybody on our bandwagon a little bit because it makes us feel better. But what if we chose in those moments to say, well, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to actually come to your defense, even if it sounds ridiculous. And I have sounded ridiculous from time to time in a lot of different scenarios. But, but are we willing to do that? And then, number three, the one you're waiting on. When I can no longer choose to trust, I will come directly to you about it. To choose to conceal rather than confront is poison to a relationship. Concealed suspicion is like poison to a relationship. Because what, what begins to happen? Well, it's the first time, you know, they did it. and That's fine. Second time, you know, man, did it again. Seventh time, you're thinking, this joker. I mean, are they, are they ever going to do what they say they're going to do? Are they ever going to commit? Are they ever going to follow through? I mean, I just can't trust this person. And then on the eighth time, it's like we, we, we took all of the seven times that we didn't say anything about to them. And then the eighth time, what do we do? It's just like verbal vomit, right? And all of a sudden, we just unleash and dump out a barrel of wrath all of us. You know, it's just like, bleh. And they're thinking, whoa, what? I mean, I didn't know. Like, I, I didn't understand. Man, you talk about tearing down a relationship. That doesn't close a gap. That doesn't inspire somebody to want to make a difference and to try to do things differently. They just know we really don't trust them. They're not listening to our advice in that moment, even if it's good advice. Because people want to be trusted because there's currency there. There's value in that. It's inspiring. It, it fuels us. It makes us want to be trustworthy. Man, I can do that. I can do that. I can be different. I can, I can work on that. Help me. How do I do that? I mean, nobody wants to, to operate in that environment. So what if, what, if, what if we were to make that commitment? I'm, gonna, I'm willing to trust first when there's a gap. That's what I'm going to put there. When somebody else is suspicious of your behavior, I'm going to come to your defense. And then when I get to a point where I literally am having trouble choosing to trust, I'm going to make sure that I come to you about it first. Gosh, what a difference that would begin to make. If we, when there's a gap, when there's a discrepancy between what has been expected and what has actually happened, saying, I'm going to put trust there. And after all, I, I recognize that's risky. It's difficult. It doesn't come naturally. But isn't that what Jesus did? And that's, that's what Jesus was willing to do. Because guess what? There is a brokenness in the relationship that we had with, with our Heavenly Father. There's a gap created by us. And Jesus chose to fill the gap with himself. He put himself there. Even knowing he couldn't trust us or completely depend on us to follow through and to never rebel, he put himself there and filled the gap with his love. What a gift.